questions, our, our requests, our supplication, indeed our thanksgiving. It's our custom to give you an opportunity to express particular concerns that may be on your hearts and minds today. You can do that with a lifting of your right hand. Okay, as always, many hands lifted. Many, many concerns are being carried into this sanctuary each Sunday morning, each Sabbath day. And now we want to take those concerns before our great God and King. Would you pray with me? Our Father and our God, we're so very thankful for the access that we have to your throne room as our great holy God, omnipotent, omniscient, all present, that we recognize that you know all things, even before we bring you our requests, that you know them and you know our needs and you answer each of our requests according to your will. We pray, Father, that you would enable us to be aware and encouraged by the knowledge that you are sovereign and that nothing can thwart your ultimate will. We pray, Father, uh, that as your children, that we can bow before you, putting our lives into your hands, our future, our concerns, our, our difficulties, our challenges, recognizing that as a Heavenly Father, you will take care of these needs in a manner perhaps we haven't anticipated, but certainly in the best way. We pray this morning for those who have lifted their hands. There are those who are struggling mightily today. We have those who have chronic illnesses who are anticipating or facing a surgery, those who are undergoing treatment for cancer and those sorts of things. We also have problems in families and marriages that are struggling. We pray, Father, that you would enable us to learn to express the love of Christ and our love for our husbands and our wives and, and certainly our covenant children that you've entrusted to us. We have covenant children who are struggling. Some have departed from the narrow way. We recognize that they may do things that are foolish and destructive, and perhaps they're unaware of the consequences of some of the decisions uh, they may make. We pray, Father, uh, that you would draw them back to the narrow way, give them wisdom to obey and to pursue your commandments. We also pray for our covenant children that you would give each of them good friends, Christian friendships, those who would encourage them in the best things and discourage them from making poor choices. We pray, Father, uh, that our covenant children would be understanding and discerning with the kind of culture that you've placed us in, uh, that there are many predators, uh, spiritual, physical, emotional predators, and that they would be guarded in terms of how they approach folks, that they would be able to resist and even to avoid certain kinds of temptation. We pray, Father, for this particular church. As we reflect on this not quite two years of being a church, we reflect on your graciousness to us and the way that you have cared for us and prospered us and blessed us, and we are in awe. We recognize, Father, that this is not the end, it's but the beginning. And we pray for the future of this particular church, that you would use this church and the various individuals that make up this church in an extraordinary way in their lives, that they would discover and use their spiritual gifts for you, that they would allow you to consecrate the abilities that you've given them, that their personalities, uh, their temperaments would be submitted to you, and that you would take the experiences that they have had and that you use those in some way for your glory, both, both the good and the bad. And we pray, Father, that you would continue to teach us as a church sound doctrine, true theology. We pray, Father, as well, that you would sanctify us as individuals, but also collectively as a church, and that as a church and as individuals, we would learn what it means to be salt and light in the midst of a dark and hurting culture. Give us, Father, the courage of our convictions. Help us to keep our desires in accord with your desires, uh, that you would indeed teach us to delight in you. We pray, Father, as well for this country. There are problems, some that seem insurmountable. There is much foolishness in high places. No common sense in the enactments and the, the kinds of laws that are being suggested. 
uh, though we recognize that we live in a difficult time, there is violence, there, there is uh, cruelty, and much foolishness. We, we also recognize that, that we will never live in a perfect society. And help us, Father, to recognize uh, that the state, the government, uh, can only do just so much. And then, and then individuals are responsible for their behavior. But we also know that you have called the church in an extraordinary way, uh, that we are to be your people, that we are to reflect the testimony from your word in our lives, and we are to speak truth in high places. We pray, Father, that you would enable us to do this with a winsome manner, uh, but with a firm manner, without compromise. Each of us have spheres of influence. We have families, we have extended families, we have friends, we have neighbors, uh, we have co-workers. We ask, Father, that you enable us to learn how to best testify and witness for you. That we would turn others away from destruction by explaining to them uh, the nature of sin. And perhaps in doing that, point them to Christ as their Redeemer. We also pray for the world. We pray for the, uh, the people of the Ukraine, those who have been displaced, so, so many, millions indeed, uh, who have lost their homes, who have lost loved ones, uh, who are in danger even at this moment. Uh, not just warriors and men, but women and children and old folks. This is a terrible, terrible situation. We pray, Father, that you bring peace to this area. And the nations of the world would unite in a way uh, that would bring pressure upon the nation of Russia to perhaps withdraw and to cease this senseless slaughter of innocents. We pray, Father, this in the blessed name of Jesus. And now we close with the prayer that he taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated, my friends. If you would open your Bible to Ephesians chapter 2 again, we continue our study. This is actually going to be uh, part 3, the last in this brief series. Our text then will be once again, chapter 2 of Ephesians, verse 19 through the end of the chapter, verse 22. Let me read that for you now. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone and in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Now, this is the Word of God. God. Let us pray for the illumination of God the Holy Spirit. Precious Holy Spirit, we do pray you illumine us as we study this portion of Holy Scripture. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. And so as I said, this is actually part three of the series of sermons or messages entitled Under Construction. And we've been doing this now for two Sundays. This would be the third and final one in which we look at this particular text. And in this text, uh, we have focused on Paul's use of metaphors in which he is trying to explain to us the manner in which he has constructed his church and he continues to construct his church. He refers to the people of God, for example, as the household of God. He, he calls our attention in talking about the household of God to the kingdom of God, but he also uses a couple of more uh, metaphors. He talks about uh, the building that is the church and the temple that is the church. And we also understand uh, that these metaphors would apply to the individual. We looked at, at Paul's writing in 1 Corinthians in which he said that the believer himself or herself actually is the temple of God the Holy Spirit. And so we understand that there is an application, much application, in both the instance of the individual believer as a temple of God that's continually under construction, but also as the collection of believers, of individuals who place their faith 
in Jesus Christ as he's offered in the gospel. Uh, this collection of individuals then is referred to as the temple of God. And then in our text, uh, we talked about the fact that Christ is referred to as the cornerstone and how significant this is if we're to understand the basis of the foundation is going to be Jesus Christ. And indeed, the direction of the construction of that temple of God is going to be Jesus Christ. The building is going to take its design uh, from the fact that Jesus is the cornerstone. And so we understand that Christ is an essential and vital part of the building or the temple of God, both in the life of the individual and in the life of a church. But Paul also writes that this temple has been built on the apostles and the prophets. And last week we spent some time talking about that, how that points us uh, back to the special revelation of God, our Holy Scripture. We understand that the prophets spoke as they were moved by God the Holy Spirit. And that God actually instructed the prophets to write down what he had told them or revealed to them in his special revelation. And by that instruction, we get both the Old and New Testaments. And so the focus as we think about the prophets of God is on God's holy word. But we also talked about the apostles, the unique office of the apostles uh, that was uniquely intended for a particular point in time in the life of the church. That in the early days of the church, as the church was moving uh, from encompassing, for the most part, the people of Israel, the Jews, as it moved to become universal in its application to the Gentile nations, the apostles were appointed. We can think of this as an apostle with a capital A, even in our text. Uh, that's not the way it's written, but it helps us to make a distinction uh, between this office of the apostle and one that might just carry out the various functions of, of going to, for example, as a missionary does, going to other nations and, and proclaiming the gospel. In some sense, they are apostles, apostles as well. But... We're to understand this office of apostle in a very narrow and specific sense. It's an office that is no longer around. It's not intended. It was never intended to be normative for the church, but it was intended for a particular point in time, as I described, uh, when the church was expanding to embrace the Gentile nations. We know that the disciples were apostles. We know that there were a few others in addition to the original disciples that were apostles, for example, the Apostle Paul. We don't know for certain that we have an exhaustive list of the apostles, uh, but probably have uh, pretty much a list of who would be understood to have the, the authority of the office of apostle. I told you as well that, that with the death of the last apostle, which was probably John, depending on when he died, maybe around 90 A.D., that's the end of what we call the apostolic era. And when the apostolic era ended, there was no more special revelation. All of God's word had already occurred. And it was already being read, the various epistles, for example. Uh, an epistle is, is a letter that Paul or someone else would have written that would, was purposed or intended to be distributed to the churches of that day. And they would do really what we do. They would take that letter and they would read it out loud. And then someone who uh, hopefully had some gift of teaching or, or preaching uh, would help to exposit or explain what the letter said and help the people of God make applications. But that was still very different than the apostles. The apostles had an authority, again, that was unique. And it's very important for us to understand that. So when, when the apostle Paul says that the foundation of the temple of God is built both on the prophets and the apostles. He's talking about uh, some very specific doctrinal truths uh, that were expounded upon and, and declared by the apostles of that particular era. Again, just so you'll have the time frame, the chronology in mind. So we're talking about uh, a few years after, well, really at the time of the ascension, the resurrection, then the ascension of Christ, you have the disciples and apostles, and then you have, uh, have Judas replaced with another, and then, and then you have the apostle Paul. And again, perhaps we might include Barnabas in that list and maybe, maybe a, a, another, but 
but we have then a very narrow period of time historically that we would refer to as, as the apost uh, apostolic era. Uh, so about the time of, of the death, burial, resurrection, ascension of Christ, then uh, to, depending on when the apostle John died, to probably A.D. 90. That's the apostolic era. So with the close of the apostolic era, we also have absolutely the close of the canon. I remember as a Christian, as a young Christian, a fellow uh, that, that uh, I worked with uh, who was, um, he was uh, a charismatic fellow, older guy, and he, he would, uh, since I was a young Christian, he, he would uh, not be reluctant to tell me things that he thought I ought to know. And so I remember him saying, and he was a good guy, I, mean, one, I remember him saying one time that, that, you know, the book of Acts is not complete, that it, it continues. And I, I, I thought, well, that's pretty cool, that's profound. I didn't even understand what he was getting at, but what he was saying was that the canon is not closed and that, that God continues to speak with special revelation just as he did to the prophets and the apostles. And uh, that's really a very dangerous point of view. That's not a, at all the truth. Uh, so though he was well-intended, he was wrong in that. And as I learned more and more, I began to uh, grasp the fact that the canon of Scripture is closed. So we use that phrase, and we use it very intentionally. The canon of Scripture is closed and it has implication and application uh, for both the lives of individual believers, but also the life of the church. Now, as we think about apostolic doctrine, Paul says that this is the foundation uh, which is going to be vital for a healthy and effective Christian's life, but also for a healthy and effective church. And so it's important to understand or have some understanding of what the apostles taught. Now, today in our worship service, we affirmed our faith with what? The Apostle Creed, didn't we? And that is a creed that states the very core, the substance, in a very concise and succinct way of what the Apostles taught. In fact, the Apostles' Creed is probably the oldest creed that's been used over the centuries in the church. In the early days, it, in the Roman church, it was called the Old Roman Creed because it was in, used, in the, first of all, in the Church of Rome. And it was often used as a means of new converts as they were about to be baptized, uh, actually testifying about their faith. Very different than the testimonies we give uh, quite often today. Uh, not that it's wrong or, or problematic for us to share about how Christ has saved us. I like to hear those kinds of subjective testimonies, but... But the Apostles' Creed, the old Roman Creed, is, is quite a bit different than that because it does focus on God. Now, did the Apostles actually write the Apostles' Creed? Well, no, they didn't actually write the Apostles' Creed. This baptismal confession uh, was a condensation, a compilation of these doctrines and these truths that the Apostles taught. And so the church, uh, right around the second century then, uh, put these together in a very succinct form and use these uh, for folks to confess their faith. If they couldn't say the Apostles' Creed with conviction and say, well, this is what I believe, uh, then there would be questions about whether or not that person had been truly converted. And that's, I, I think, an, a fair thing. It's a fair thing for us to expect that people who profess to know Christ, to be a Christian, to believe particular propositions uh, about theology, about soteriology, you know, how we're saved, about Jesus Christ, Christology, and, and understanding who God is, theology. We need to understand particular things, not exhaustively, none of us are going to be at that place, but there are certain things that it's fair uh, for someone to ask us, do you believe this and so, in their, their attempt to try to either, well, evaluate whether or not we have a genuine faith, but but perhaps even to help us a bit with that if we're not quite where we should be. And so right around the second century, probably moving into, uh, oh, the first part of the second century, so the hundreds A.D., uh, you began to see that the Apostles' Creed was beginning to be used by not just the Roman church uh, for uh, baptismal uh, profession of faith, but also in other churches around that part of the, of the world. Now, the Apostles' Creed can divi be divided into three parts. Look at your bulletin, if you would, there, and you can actually see what I'm, I'm talking about. So there's three parts. The first part is pretty short, isn't it? 
I believe in God the Father, Almighty Maker of heaven and earth. So, so, so to understand the, the structure and the organization of the Apostles' Creed, we have to understand the doctrine of the Trinity because that's what the organization and structure is based upon. And so the first part, part one of the Apostles' Creed, refers to and speaks of God the Father, the first person of the Trinity. The second part refers to God the Son. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He ascended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he be, uh, will come to judge the living and the dead. Okay? So that's part two. Part two deals with the second person of the Trinity, God the Son. And part three deals with God the Holy Spirit and also the work of the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. What's amen mean? Let it be, and so it is, or something like that, right? And so, the Apostles' Creed is really not very long, is it? It's not as long as the Nicene Creed, for example. Uh, but it is jam-packed with all kinds of meaty theological truths, and it's very important uh, to us, when we affirm it, you might, you probably haven't even really thought of it so much uh, as you're, as you're either reciting. I know many of you have the Apostles' Creed memorized, or, or you're reading it. Uh, you, you probably haven't thought so much about this, but you're really professing what we would call the Orthodox Christian faith. And if you don't believe some of the things that are in the Apostles' Creed, or I might even say anything that's in the Apostles' Creed then there may be a problem somewhere. It could just be a gap in your understanding. It could also be something uh, more serious, couldn't it? So, recalling that Christ is the cornerstone of the church, remember that? Then we understand that the, why the larger part of the Apostles' Creed is devoted to Jesus Christ. And so when we look at this old Roman Creed, we understand that this is a condensation, a statement, of what the apostles taught, okay? It's important. Now, I want to shift gears for just a minute, and we'll come back to this. Let's talk for just a minute about the fundamentals of the faith. You know, you've heard me use that phrase a lot. I know some of you could recite the fundamentals, and some of you uh, perhaps are unfamiliar with them. I want to talk to you about where these fundamentals came from. What was the, uh, how did, did, they, did uh, someone come up with the fundamentals of the faith and what was going on at the particular time in the life of the church uh, that they thought it necessary to come up with fundamentals of the faith. During the latter part of the 19th century, okay, so the latter part of the 1800s, uh, we had in Germany, uh, we had a particular school or discipline uh, called the School of Higher Criticism. And there were various iterations of the School of Higher Criticism in Germany, but in a nutshell, or what the School of Higher Criticism did was it cast aspersions on the veracity, the truthfulness, uh, and the integrity, and the reliability of the Scripture. And they did this by going back and saying, well, if you look at the original context uh, and, and the manner in which the particular books of the Bible uh, was composed, you'll begin to understand a little better that some of these were simply oral traditions. They weren't intended to be understood in a very literal way. And, and so what, what these, these scholars, and they were scholars, they were smart guys, stupid guys that were smart. You ever know a, a smart guy that's stupid? Uh, well, they were smart guys, but they were also stupid, you know? And I say they were stupid because they were actually poking holes into the most important thing that God's given us other than my, our actual redemption in Jesus Christ, and that's the Scripture. And so as this began to, you know, what are the, one of the effects of, of having people who are respected and who have positions of respect, uh, one of the effects of, of, of their um, promoting certain ideas is that other people sometimes are in awe of them, and they, they bow to what these people are saying. And so at this particular time and moving into the 20th century, uh, many theologians around the world were in awe of the German scholarship. And so they began to say, well, I'm not sure I really, really like that or necessarily understand it completely, but 
if, if air so-and-so you know, says it, it must be true. And so they begin to embrace it. If not embrace it wholeheartedly, uh, then they begin to allow their view of Scripture uh, to deteriorate and diminish. Now, this was a, a long time ago, but the effects of this continue today. Going back then to, to the turn of the 20th century, the early 1900s, right, uh, we begin to see this moving through what we call today mainline denominations. Uh, and most of the mainline denominations, uh, the seminaries, the, the hierarchy of the denominations, and as consequently the church, where do the preachers come from in a denomination? They come from the seminaries and whatnot, okay? So what's happening up here, you don't have a lot of contact with it, right? Uh, but probably your preacher has uh, come from there or has had contact with them. So as the hierarchies of these seminaries uh, begin to be affected by the German School of Higher Criticism, and again, again, there's, there's other iterations of that, uh, but we're, our purpose is not to spend a lot of time talking about uh, the, the School of Higher Criticism of Germany, but rather just to talk about its effect. As this began to be embraced by, listen to this now, because this is really important. I know you're thinking, ah, gosh, this is a little boring talking about history, but this is important to understand how we got to where we are today and what we need to do about it. What happened then is that, that in, at the turn of the 20th century, many of the mainline denominations uh, began to be affected by this, and, and this effect began to color the way they looked at the scriptures. And as the scriptures were diminished in terms of their, their integrity in the eyes of, of the teachers and the preachers, then also the people themselves uh, began to uh, have a lower view of the scriptures. Now, this is a very, a very dangerous situation uh, for a church, uh, the people of God, a building of God, as, he's, as this building of God is under construction and then the very foundation is is being circumvented this way? Think about that. If you have a home or you're building a home, one of the things you want to make sure of is that the foundation is pretty good, right? And you don't want the foundation itself to be weak or cracked or flawed because you recognize if the foundation's not good, then whatever we build on it's not going to be very secure. So this is what's happening in the early church. And there were conservative scholars that saw this modernism, this is what it was called at that time. It was called theological modernism, uh, not a f just a few years ago. We would have called it theological liberalism. I still do. Uh, but today they call liberalism what? Progressivism. I don't, I don't really get that because to me it's not progress. Uh, but, but they call it theological progressivism. So it was taking over the main line denominations. And so there was a group of 60 plus preachers and teachers and conservative scholars who saw what was happening. And God always has a remnant. He always does. It's not going to be the majority. A remnant is by, by definition a smaller group. But he always has a remnant. And at this time, he had a remnant of men who were faithful to the scriptures as God had inspired them and inscripturated them. And so these men began to write essays, about 90. And these essays refuted the theological liberalism or modernism, again, as it was called at the time. And so when they would say, well, thus and so, then these scholars would take that point and then they would repudiate it and refute it. And as these essays were edited or compiled, they were called the fundamentals of the faith. And they were finally and ultimately actually put together in two volumes called the fundamentals. Now, what's important for us to understand is that this was a watershed moment uh, for the church in America and in the Western world. When the mainline denominations were going through many, many changes, and many of you have come from mainline denominations, and you listen to your preacher sometimes, and you hear him talk about the ordination of practicing homosexuals, or, you know, gay marriage, uh, you know, promotion of things like abortion or whatever, you know, the, the kinds of things that give you some heartburn, right? And you're sitting there and you're listening to these things and you're wondering, what in the world is this guy talking about? Or now, what in the world is she talking about, you know? Yeah. 
you're just you're just confused because you're thinking, you know, I got a Bible here, and you know what this person is saying, it just doesn't line up with what my Bible is saying. So where's that coming from? Well, you see, that person doesn't really think it's all that important what the Bible says. What's well, important to that person that happens to be teaching or preaching there is what they think the ter- the Bible ought to say. And so you understand this. Some of you better than me. I came from from an unchurched family to a Southern Baptist uh, church. And, uh, you know, some of the stuff that you guys have been through, I've never actually personally even, even um, you know, heard anybody from the pulpit say some of the things that you, you guys have told me that you've heard. But the point is that what was happening at the turn of the 20th century continues to impact us and affect us even today. So these fundamentals of faith actually refuted uh, theological modernism of that time. Francis Schaeffer wrote a book called The Great Evangelical Disaster in which he actually he, he explained how this process uh, was, was un, unwrapped and unveiled and he took those fundamentals of faith and he actually condensed them into five fundamentals of the faith. And when I talk about the five fundamentals, it's coming... Uh, its origin is the fundamentals of faith that were written in those 90 plus essays, but, but it really is Schaefer's condensation. And so the fundamentals of the faith are on that sheet of paper there, and the, there's five of them. The first one is the inerrancy and infallibility of God. The second one is the virgin birth and consequently deity of Christ. The third one is the atoning work of Jesus Christ. The fourth one is the physical resurrection of Christ. And the fifth one is a belief in the literal, physical second coming of Jesus Christ. That's the five fundamentals of faith. And so these scholars who wrote the original fundamentals, were uh, they would say that if you, if you reject the fundamentals of the faith, then there is a problem with your faith. Perhaps your faith is not a true faith because you have departed uh, from what we understand uh, as a biblical uh, faith of, of the apostles, and therefore... You know, if you're at odds with the apostolic faith that's been handed down through the church over the centuries, uh, then it could be a very significant problem. One of the guys about this time who was really a, a very, very uh, scholarly guy, his name was J. Gresham Machen. You've probably heard me quote him before. He actually started the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, and he, was, he funded the early days of the Westminster Seminary up in Philadelphia. He was actually excommunicated from a mainline denomination because he believed the Bible. I mean, that's a little bit of a simplification, but that's pretty much what happened. Isn't that an interesting thing? Uh, but he made the comment regarding uh, these fundamentals. He said, if you doubt one of those fundamentals of the faith, you can still be a religious person, but you can't really count yourself as a Christian. You see, he got it. He understood that those fundamentals of the faith were actually reflections of that apostolic faith that was handed down over the centuries. Now, think about this uh, uh, for just a minute. Look, if you would, again, at the Apostles' Creed. And let me show you how this is actually reflective of the five fundamentals of the faith. So, again, Christ is our cornerstone, correct? And so that second, longer part of the Apostles' Creed is all about Jesus Christ. Now, the five fundamentals of the faith are, first of all, a belief in the inerrancy and infallibility of Scripture. Now, where is that in this Apostles' Creed? Well, that's kind of a trick question. You see, the only reason we know anything about Jesus and the gospel is Holy Scripture. And so, everything that we read in part two, in regard, actually part one and three as well, but talking about part two now, part two that describes Jesus, we understand from Scripture. And so if we reject or deny the first fundamental of the faith, the inerrancy and infallibility of Scripture, what do you suppose will happen to the other fundamentals of the faith, the other parts of apostolic doctrine? Well, they're going to fall just like dominoes. They're going to fall quite naturally. And so though we we might not initially reject, let's say, the virgin birth of Christ, but if we we reject the veracity, the truthfulness of Scripture, the inerrancy of Scripture, the trustworthiness of Scripture, eventually then we're going to reject those other things. 
either in part or in toto. So, the second fundamental of the faith then, uh, we find there in the second line of part two, and was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. You see that? And so here we have the declaration of what the apostles taught about the birth of Jesus Christ. And then we have the third fundamental of the faith, the atoning work of Jesus Christ, here in the third line. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. That's number three of the fundamentals. And then we have number four. The third day he rose again from the dead. Remember what the fourth fundamental was? Belief in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ, right? And then we have the fifth fundamental of the faith, the last part of part two. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. What is that a reference to? The second coming of Christ. And so you have there the five fundamentals of the faith. They're in the second part, just the second part of the Apostles' Creed. And again, why is the Apostles' Creed important to us? Because it's reflective of the teaching of the Apostles, who were set apart in an extraordinary way uh, to both superintend uh, the, the, in, uh, the inscripturization of, of truth, that uh, special revelation, but also to superintend how the church incorporated and appropriated those truths. And so it's very, very important what the apostles taught. And you say, well, I don't really care about that. What I care about is what the Bible says. This is what the Bible says, okay? So there's no contradiction there at all. This is expressing to us in a very succinct, concise way of what the apostles taught and what the Bible says. And so we take it seriously. When we affirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed, we're not saved by just affirming that. What we're basically saying is something we've already come to believe in our life, and so we were saved by that faith in what we've come to believe. We're not saved by going through the rote process of reciting any creed uh, at, at, at all, or a confession, or anything of that manner. Now, let me talk a little more about those five fundamentals. The first one, the inerrancy and infallibility of Scripture. Let me read a few scriptures uh, that, that speak to the importance of, of the infallibility. And in, Well, we did it last week, as a matter of fact. We talked about uh, 2 Corinthians, uh, rather 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. So let's look at that for just a moment. If you've got your Bible, open it to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 to 17. All scripture is inspired by God. You, you know, I think most of you know, not all of you perhaps, but that the Greek word there that's translated as inspired in the New American Standard Version is theonoustos, which, is, which means literally God breathed. Now, if you have the New International Version, and some of you do, it actually will, will be translated as God breathed. But, but the point there is that the source of scripture is God himself. By God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. And then if we were to turn back uh, to the Gospel of John, to chapter 17, this is what we call Christ's high priestly prayer, when he's actually praying for believers and praying for the church that would come. In 17, verse 17 of chapter 17, we read this, Sanctify them in truth, your word is truth. And so we understand that the Scripture is the truth. We understand that the Scripture must be accepted as the inerrant, that means without error in the original autographs, and the infallible, completely trustworthy Word of God. God has provided for us a reliable, special revelation, and in His providence, He has seen that that was compiled, these 66 books of the Bible were compiled and preserved and handed down to us today so that we understand uh, who God is, who we are, what our problem is with the fall and sin, and how we might be redeemed, and indeed how we are to live lives that please God. We know that without question as we read the scripture, so it's important. Now, that second fundamental of the faith, 
the virgin birth. Many people think, well, is that so important? Is it really important? Well, the reason it's important is because the deity of Christ is connected uh, with the virgin birth. Listen to the prophet Isaiah in chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. Let me read Matthew 1.18, which contains a quote of that. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. An angel appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. There you see, we understand uh, that the virgin birth is actually connected there with the deity of Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. And so is the virgin birth an essential of the faith? It absolutely is, because if you lose the, vir lose the virgin birth, you lose the deity of Jesus Christ. The atoning work of Jesus Christ, that's the third fundamental. Listen to Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for all well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging we are healed. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Again, this is the reference to Christ and his work. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And then 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. So this is, these are scripture verses that actually uh, help us to understand the atoning work of Jesus Christ. And finally, in Romans 4, verse 25, he was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our uh, justification. Now, how about the physical resurrection? I said that I don't really ever remember hearing a preacher say something that was directly contradictory of the fundamental faith. That actually is not true. When I was going to South Texas, um, uh, Southwest Texas, many, many years ago uh, for a bit, uh, I actually, I won Easter. I, I uh, came, I didn't live here then, but I came and, and I went to First Protestant Church downtown New Braunfels. And the guy that was preaching was an interim preacher, but he was a, he was a very impressive guy. He held some kind of position in a seminary and, and was quite articulate and eloquent. Anyway, in the course of his preaching and talking about the resurrection of Christ, he made it very clear, he said quite directly, that you must not understand the resurrection of Christ as a physical resurrection. You should only understand it as a spiritual resurrection. In other words, the Easter narrative is simply a metaphor for some sort of you know, second chance in life or something like that. So he was, from the pulpit, repudiating and rejecting uh, this fourth fundamental of the faith. And in so doing, he was repudiating and rejecting the teaching of the apostles. And in so doing, he was actually destroying the foundation of that particular church, which is the teaching of the apostles. And how about the second coming? Listen to Matthew 24, 27. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Matthew 24, 42 and 44. Therefore, be on the alert. Uh, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. For this reason you must also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. And then Acts 1.11, uh, the angels speaking. They also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up uh, from you into heaven will come in just the same way uh, as you have watched him go into heaven. These are just a few of the passages of scriptures uh, that, explain to us and declare to us that Christ will come back physical, uh, physically and literally uh, at a point in which we don't anticipate, but there will be a second coming of Jesus Christ. That's the fifth fundamental of the faith. And so those who deny any of those five fundamentals of the faith uh, are actually 
denying the faith itself. They may not completely understand that that's what they're doing, uh, but understand that those who are in the hierarchy of churches and denominations, those who are preaching and teaching, they understand exactly what they're doing when they reject the fundamentals of the faith. They intend to reject the fundamentals of the faith because they do not believe uh, the, the apostolic doctrines and teachings, and they ultimately don't believe the Bible itself. Now, on that fifth, that fifth fundamental, let me say this because, you know, folks are always interested in end times. Uh, I, I want to say that there are different views about the end times, but what is absolutely non-negotiable is the fact that Christ is going to return a second time, okay? All the particulars and, and, and the scenarios before and after that, there are differences among Bible-believing Christians about all that stuff. I'll just, I'll, I'll give you a real, kind of a rule of thumb here um, that, that sort of people ask me sometimes, what's your eschatology? What do you think about the end times? Well, this is, this is not what I think about the end times, but this is the criterion by which I judge teaching on the end times. Over, this, this is a graph. Right here, let's, let's say this is uh, uh, complexity. And right here is truthfulness. And that might be a little harsh, or I might just say legitimacy. Okay, so this is a graph, guys. All right. So, 1, 5, 10, 1, 5, 10. So, a biblical understanding of the second coming of Christ will not be, uh, become increasingly com complicated and difficult to understand. It will actually become increasingly simple. And the truthfulness of the explanation that you're hearing goes up as the explanation becomes more simple. So, what am I saying? Jesus is coming back. And he's upset. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's going to conclude our, our study of, of the church under construction. Understand again uh, that it is important what we believe as a church and as individuals. And to the extent as individuals we're able to fine tune our understanding of what the scripture teaches us and using mechanisms and and, and instruments like the creeds, that helps us. And the confession, the Westminster Confession is a, is a great systematic theology that helps us understand the teaching of Scripture uh, on, on Scripture, on God, on, on sin, on uh, salvation, just a, a whole bunch of different things. On, on Wednesdays before we have our prayer meeting, uh, the guys, we, we actually read a chapter of the confession and, and, and talk just a bit about that. So, so the confessions and the creeds are valuable in that they reflect what the Scripture says. If they contradict what the Scripture says, then, then at least that portion of contradiction, you need to discard it, reject it. Because we want to know what the Scripture says because that's what the prophets and the apostles have said, isn't it? Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we're so very thankful for the teaching of your word. We recognize that we are ever reforming, that, that as a reformed folk, we, we have not yet arrived. We don't have all the truth. We, we do have the substantive truth, and we are determined to continue to grow in the sanctification process uh, until you take us to be home with you. We also want to reflect humility and what we believe, especially as we share what we believe with others, with our friends and family. Uh, we understand uh, that we can, we can win arguments but ultimately lose. And so we want to be very careful uh, how we explain what we understand about Christ and about our faith to others. Help us to be more winsome in that. Uh, help us to remember back when we didn't know the gospel of Christ and so that we can identify with the struggles that people are having. I also pray, Father, for us to endeavor to become uh, more bold witnesses of the gospel of Christ. The truth is that there is no hope in this lost and hurting world apart from the gospel of Christ. And there's no hope for individual men and women apart uh, from the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we want to be reminded of that each day so that we will purpose to find opportunities and take advantage of opportunities that you provide for us to share the gospel of Christ uh, to a dark and hurting world. 
I pray, Father, that our church also uh, would learn to adorn the gospel of Jesus Christ with works of mercy and good works. We pray, Father, that you would engage us and, and equip us uh, to, in taking the gospel to do good things for folks uh, so that they'll want to listen to what we have to say. And we don't know exactly where that will be and you know, where you'll take us, but we do know, Father, uh, that you will enable us uh, to be soft and light in this dark and hurting world. And especially as we do it, may we enjoy the fellowship we have with one another. May we learn to love one another in, in a better and deeper way. Gr help us to grow in intimacy in our relationships with one another so that this church will be a unified church, a body of Christ with one witness, the gospel of Christ, and help us to have one teaching. That would be the whole counsel of your word. In Jesus' blessed name we pray. Amen and amen. Thanks for our closing hymn. There for just a little bit, I was worried.